London by the early 19th century is shown to emerge as the sculptural capital of the world and evolve as a special hub of what is called sculptural cosmopolitanism in the long Victorian era, with the constant influx of the best of continental sculptors, especially from Italy and France. It is in this environment that the period's neoclassical schools of marble and bronze sculpture blended into the making of an imperial sculptural iconography to feed the commemorative demands of the colonies. So as is true now in many cases, without the colonies, this art of statuary may not even have flourished. So the colonies are absolutely crucial to the making of this art. Calcutta's long cast of its marble and bronze imperial men can be placed within these detailed histories of sculptural commissions and productions that move between the colony and the metropolis, charting the transition from the early preponderance of marble and neoclassical allegorical styles to the later premium on realistic, gigantic bronze casting. So this is a, a classic instance of the early neoclassical style, what we are calling with the use of marble. Practically each of these items of Calcutta's colonial period statuary can in the process acquire an individuated identity as an artwork associated with the studio and style of a known sculptor of the period with these names of engraved, with these engraved names of artists and foundries inscribed on the body. These are searched out either from the body of the object or from the pedestal. And there's a lot of work. There are two, three anthologies which are on uh, British figurative sculpture in the colonies and particularly in India. Among this repertoire, for instance, one of the finest work is seen to be this piece by Richard Westmacott, a Royal Academy artist, made in 1828 of the sculptural group of Warren Hastings in a Roman toga. But this is not a cut and paste job. So it's interesting that, of course, Hastings face is taken, and then you are putting him, of course, Hastings never wore this toga, but he's made to stand that way. Uh, a classicist figure, flanked by a Brahmin Pandit and Muslim scribe, which moved from the West Quadrangle, uh, which moved to the West Quadrangle of the Victoria Memorial in 1921 from its prior location at the portico of the town hall. Or say these grand equestrian figures of Lord Hardinge, and General Uttram, Hardinge is on the right and Uttram here, which are erected in 1859, the Hardinge one, and 1874, Uttram, as the final exa finest examples of the mid 19th century sculptures of John Henry Foley. So I first encountered Uttram when some scholars came saying one of the finest works of Foley exists in the city, which is this equestrian statue of Uttram. And it's with him that I first encountered, I remember, searching him out because he's now in one very far corner of the uh, Victoria Memorial. From the earliest marble statue of Lord Cornwallis in Roman costume, which we saw sculpted in 1803 by Thomas Banks, to the last imperial bronze of Emperor George V. This is the last imperial statue to be commissioned in Calcutta because the Calcutta Corporation had by then come under the Congress. Um, Okay, so this is made by the Scottish sculptor William Macmillan. Calcutta's colonial statues can be situated within a changing history of techniques and stylistic conventions of the British school of figurative sculpture. Ironically, it is in the quiet exile of their post-colonial locations, in the serenity of the background, in the serenity of the grounds of the Barakpur Flagstaff House. Also in the enclosed picturesque gardens of the Victoria Memorial, that these statues today make themselves available for the close and specialized study of their sculptural form. In the one site, Barakpur, they're open to viewing only by select groups of dignitaries, visitors, and scholars by special appointment with the Calcutta Raj Bhavan to enter the governor's residence there. In the other site, in Victoria Memorial, they're used as backdrops for snapshots and seating spots for courting couples. They lie waiting to be searched out and professionally photographed by traveling British scholars. And I must tell you that when I went there photographing, these couples were not happy at all that I was photographing. They thought I was photographing them. No, I wasn't. I was photographing the sculpture, but anyway. So, uh, so anyway, they, they now exist as backdrops for selfies. Just now I was trying to take a photograph of 
Queen Victoria, and I had to wait and wait till everybody had finished taking their selfies before I could take my only shot. So they exist this backdrop. Anyway, at the okay, emptied of the personhood of colonial rulers, these statues, I would argue, have made their unintended transition into becoming pure works of sculpture. So either they're fully ignored by bulk of the crowds who move around, or the specialist scholar comes to search them out as the work of such and such. At the same time, they continue to have their effective resonances. So we find ourselves drawn to the solitary figure of Lord Canning on his horseback, now banished to the riverbank of Barakpur, keeping watch over Lady Canning's tomb on the bleak riverbank. Even as local residents pull us towards a reverse nationalist history of Indian martyrdom in this cantonment town of Barakpur, where a sculpted bust on a noose marks the site under the banyan tree of the hanging of Sipai Mangal Pandey during 1857. So now it's called the Mangal Pandey Park. You ask anybody where is Lord Canning, they cannot tell you, but they will tell you where the Mangal Pandey Park is. Again, who knew what Mangal Pandey looked out, but it's a very dramatic statue with a noose. It was in the secluded intimacy of his Barakpur residence that West Bengal's governor, Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi, decided in 2007 to launch, I quote, his witty conversation with the 12 Raj statues on the grounds whom he considered to be really speaking the house's only true residence. Admiring the Greek godlike marble body, waving hair and perfectly made boots of the young Captain William Peel. He wondered why fate made this handsome youth die, not a hero's death on the battlefield, but of the dreaded Indian smallpox. Looking at the water stains on the patina of the head of Emperor George V, now brought to an eye level on the steps of the cenotaph, he sympathized with his majesty, perspiring beneath the burden of his crown and heavy robes. He also empathized with the way Lord Napier, on the left, stands a bit lost under his oversized helmet and obscured by an even bigger horse pushing his nozzle into the trees. And as Gandhi's grandson, he even pondered how the launch of the first non-cooperation movement must have squeezed out the pomp and thrown into deep worry this unusual figure of the thoughtful, brooding, bald Secretary of State, Montague, sculpted by H. Hilton Young. So this is Gopal Gandhi's wonderful conversation with the Raj statues. No such scholarly attention or empathy lies in store for the nationalist statues as they stand alone, ignored, and barely seen among the crowds and traffic in the congested heart of the city. Nor, with the exception of Kamal Sharka's work, and that too, that's a dictionary, has there been any equivalent trend of scholarly or art historical interest in the form and style of these figures, in who may have sculpted them, or in what occasion they're making and placement in these locations. Most telling is the way the identity of the sculptors who were commissioned to make these figures stand in complete erasure. The plaques on the plinth carry, in most case, the dignitaries who were present at the unveiling of the function of the object, and not any details. So here, the, this Vidyashagar statue in Curzon Park will tell you, yes, briefly, it's Isha Chandra Vidyashagar, but in great detail, who were the people who unveiled it? But we really don't know who made them at all. Almost never is there a name to be read, recognized, and reckoned of the sculptor who produced these statues. The same seems to be true for much of the commissioned public art that have come up in places like Newtown Rajarhat. Again, no names of makers. The only time you have the name of a maker is if it's Mamata Banerjee's own art. Then it's there, you know. But otherwise, we never know the name of the maker. This absence is what most insistently shows up the failure of these objects to qualify as works of sculpture. Even as they barely fulfill their commemorative duties towards the person they set out to immortalize. As the ceremonial purpose for which they were once made and put in place uh, fade from public memory, so retreats the aura of presence and personalities from these mute figures, hollowing out even their meaning as statues. Ritually fetid at every birth anniversary, no one even bothers to remove the dried garlands that remain strung around them for the rest of the year. Okay, 
If I haven't run out of time, can I read the last section? Yeah? Okay, sure, okay. No, it, it is getting dark, okay. This is the, the very last section. Now, this is the relatively still to be developed part of the paper, but I'm hoping this is where I can take the work further. It is commonplace to conceive of the careers of the city's post-colonial statuary, not just in terms of neglect, but also of the corruption and degeneration of the colonial sculptural genre, where we are forced to continuously juxtapose the fine art of the British school of standing and equestrian figurative sculpture with the slipping standards and loosening realist criteria of the locally proliferating output of figures and busts of local, of Indian and Bengali leaders, and rightly so. Um, currently, such slipping standards, much to our alarm, have hit an all-time low in the statues that are now cropping up in every corner of our city. I'm just showing you one example. I live in Salt Lake, where every roundabout has a, you know, this kind of horror uh, to which we confront. It is in this context, it is in this context perhaps of this very rapid slippage that I wish to revisit in this last section the early history of the transference of this practice of statue making from British to Indian sculptors, from colonial to the new nationalist civic authorities of the Calcutta Corporation in the decades preceding independence. It is significant to note that the Congress is coming to power in 1923 within this municipal body with Chitaranjan Dash as mayor. The naming of the Central Avenue as Chitaranjan Avenue is happening in the colonial period. Brought a dramatic halt in the erection of statues of colonial rulers in the streets of Calcutta in the 30s. So George V is the last one to be erected. This is also the time from which the first statues of Indian nationalists and notables begin to compete with their colonial counterparts in the main junctions of the city, with the first group of art school trained academic sculptors taking on some of these commissions. Particularly interesting to chart, and this is work that is still ongoing, is the coming into being of a group of sculptors in the city, all of whom carry the occupational name of Pal, who emerge from the traditional clay modeling families of Krishnanagar and Kumutuli in Calcutta, who thereafter move into European and government art school training in neoclassical and realist sculpture making to branch out from clay idol making to a parallel livelihood in commission sculpture. Most important among them are three figures. First among them, Gopeshwar Pal, who traveled in 1924 to the Indian Empire exhibition at Wembley in London. He was actually taken and he was called the lightning sculptor. He was placed in display and he would be continuously sculpting, making his sculptures there, and then flattening them and again sculpting them. So he was almost on display. From there, he proceeds on a British government scholarship for training in Italy in the art of marble statuary before returning home in his new role as a realist sculptor in the mid-1930s, using his skills to transform the traditional image of Durga into a realist animated figure, while also gaining his first commissions in statue making. So the first realist Durga, and so much of my work in statue making came out of my interest in Pujo itself, because I found Gopeshwar Pal, such an important figure of Kumar Tuli, is also laying this open. Okay. Following his untimely death in 1944, the studio he set up, Gopeshwar Pal, which came to be called G. Pal and Sons in the vicinities of Kumutuli, soon steered clear of making Durga Pratimas and began to instead supply the city's main stock of public sculptures of important persons in plaster and marble. So here is a, the studio with Gopeshwar Pal's portrait. Thereafter, we see the folding of the careers, unfolding of the careers of two other Pals, Shunil Pal, who was trained in the Government School of Art from 1935 to 40, and became one of the city's main statue makers as the first commissions for statues of nationalist leaders came up from the two successive United Front governments and Congress governments between 1966 and 77. And then there was Ramesh Chandra Pal of Krishnanagar, who was trained in the Government School of Art Calcutta in the 1940s under Principal Mukulde, 
who developed a special flair for the traditions of Greco-Roman and European neoclassical sculpture at the art school, and who from the 1970s combined his career as the period's most renowned maker of Calcutta's largest, most statuesque, and resplendent Durga idols, with the commissions he gained for sculpting the figures of Deshbundu Chitranjan Dash, Shudra Shen, or Matongini Hajra that we've seen. For each of these artists, if we may give them the name at all, it was their skills in statue making that made of them sculptors as against mere idol makers. So within the Kumot Tuli, they become artists when they can do realist academic work. But even as the statues they made would find little recognition in the streets as works of art or as their authored productions. This was and has remained the central paradox in this practice and profession. It is through the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that the city's first lot of Indian sculpted statues of local personalities in marble and bronze appear on the cityscape side by side with their colonial peers. Most important among these was a cast of personalities sculpted by Gopal while he's still alive in the late 1930s and early 40s that range from Girish Chandra Ghosh, Rani Rashmoni, but one of his best, finest works is actually in the Victoria Memorial, which is of the industrialist Sir Rajendranath Mukherjee, posing with the architectural drawing and plan of this very building that his firm of Martin Byrne had constructed. So I find this a really moving piece carrying the scroll of Rajendranath Mukherjee. This was, of course, in Dalhousie, in front of the Martin Byrne building before it moves here. From Gopeshwar Pal, let us turn briefly to the formative career of the Bengal academic realist painter and sculptor, Devi Prashad Rai Choudhury, who was trained in the Government Art College, Calcutta, as a student of Abhinindu Nattago, who would thereafter graduate to a career in landscape painting, portraiture, and commissioned sculpture, and become, in some sense, the first official national sculptor of independent India. So if Nandalal Bosch is the official national painter of some ways, Devi Prashad is the official national sculptor. Uh, it was while serving as vice principal of the Madras Art College in the pre-independence years that Devi Prashad was selected by a local commemoration committee and awarded his two most prestigious commissions of making bronze sculptures of Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee and Shurendranath Banerjee, one which he completed in 1934 and the other in 1941. I think the Ashutosh one really needs restoration and cleaning. Shurendranath is lying hidden in Curzon Park, now called Shurendranath Uddan. It was very hard locating him even. There are fascinating material histories to be uncovered here of the long travel and arduous transactions of objects and technologies that lie behind the making of these statues. And here, for some of this information, I'm very grateful to Kamal Sharka's work because he pieces this information together. At a time when the technology and foundries for making bronze sculpture was still largely abroad, both these figures made by Devi Prashad, Ashutosh Mukherjee and Shurendranath Banerjee, traveled as plaster of Paris models all the way to Italy to be cast in bronze and returned to Calcutta, with even the stone pedestal of the Shurendranath statue ordered and shipped from sculpting studios of Italy. Then, with the outbreak of the Second World War, the completed 11-foot bronze figure of Shurendranath, along with its 14-feet pedestal, remained trapped as enemy property in a captured Italian ship at the Calcutta docks. Till the Calcutta Memorial Committee that had spent over 30,000 on this commission secured its release from the ship and had it erected in Esplanade's Curzon Park next to the Octolony Monument. So there's a lot of drama now that he's stuck in an enemy ship and it has to be restored. In Devi Prashad Shurendranath, we see the closest transposition of the poses and conventions of the Western sculptural genre. The figure's swagger, flowing coat and trousers lending itself to a perfect replication of its many colonial counterparts. In his now forgotten enclosure in Curzon Park, now called Shurendranath Uddan, hidden behind the city's biggest bus depot, the statue holds its own as an example of the best of our early nationalist statuary against the latter day standardized bronze figures and busts such as these of, you know, we saw one of Bidda Shagur and this is one of De Rosio, 
and I use that too, uh, where uh, Shuran Ronath Banerjee stands against that. Yet for the sculptor, Debi Prashad, he candidly admitted this in a newspaper interview of the time, neither the Ashutosh Mukherjee nor the Shurendranath Banerjee sculpture quite met the measure of what he had hoped to achieve. It is with his later iconic bronze figure of Mahatma Gandhi on his Dandi march that he felt he had made his most satisfying public sculpture for the city. Executed over two years, completed in 1958, this is the first official Gandhi statue to come up, a decade after Gandhi's death, the sculptor had to finally take recourse to melting a bronze bust he had made of his own father to meet an acute shortage of metal in the city that year, to correct and repair on time the leg of Gandhi that had been dam damaged in the process of its lifting onto its pedestal. Now Nehru was coming to inaugurate it, so it had to be kept ready. So you can imagine, we all work under those constraints. So, you know, Raghu Rai had to come on a certain day, so you had to get your work ready. So Devi Prashad is similarly working under those constraints. Uh, so he actually melts the bronze from the statue of his own father to uh, repair this leg. We're invited to think here of an affective flow of molten bronze from the figure of Devi Prashad's own father to that of the father of the nation. Also from this original statue carefully nurtured by its maker to the replica that would travel to other cities like Madras. So there's one which is in the Marina Beach. In the 1950s, Devi Prashad's Gandhi takes its canonical space in the national kind of landscape with his other monumental public sculptural works like the Martyrs Memorial in Sangsad Marg in Delhi or this Triumph of Labor statue which is in the National Gallery of Modern Art to produce an official social realist iconography for the new nation. Dislodging Foley's sculpture of General Utram, which had stood for 84 years at the Park Street Churangi crossing, the erection in this prime location of the city's first statue of Gandhi, on which the government had invested no less than 60,000 rupees, with Prime Minister Nehru presiding over its opening, marks a key moment in the history of Calcutta's post-colonial statuary. Other important nationalist cultural histories would also be enacted in the same vicinities during the 50s and 60s, as for instance, with the commissioning of Calcutta's first bronze statue of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch by the West Bengal Chief Minister Bidhan Chandra Rai in 1958, the year of the opening of the Gandhi statue, to occupy the island on the southeast corner of Raj Bhavan that had already been vacated because Hardinger's statue had traveled back to England, to his hometown. It comes as a surprise.